good afternoon, everybody. This is Guillermo Sabatier, your host for Perspectives on Energy today on Tech Tech Hawaii, and welcome to the show. Um, again, I am the Director of International Services for HSI, and uh, once again, I am happy and proud to be your host for today's episode. Uh, today, we are going to discuss, uh, this is a, the fourth installment on this uh, series of a NERC exam certification prep uh, questions. We're doing a few questions, and uh, this is the last, uh, the fourth and final one for this series, but certainly not the last one for uh, by any means. Uh, we're going to be discussing emergency operations and emergency response and a few other topics. And hopefully the intent of these um, exam questions is to give everybody a taste of what to expect on the NERC RC certification exam. Now, mind you, a lot of these uh, questions come from our NERC test prep uh, course where we provide you with a, at HSI, we provide you with an online uh, NERC test prep program that will get most participants ready to pass the exam, but we also offer a three and a half day instructor lab course that is live. And of course, the prerequisites for that usually involve having taken all of your online modules, and then you take this three and a half day course right before you're ready to take your exam. So without further ado, let's go ahead and show our presentation where we have our test questions. I think we have about maybe 10, 11 questions, and that's about the right amount of time we need to go ahead and present that. So the whole point about emergency operations is that we're normally, like last week, we talked about the uh, the issue with uh, scenarios, uh, dealing with a scenario and the power system and how to react. And, and as I was talking last week, we were discussing the, the challenges, right, where if you try and take the exam prep courses and all you're doing is memorizing questions and answers, you are going to experience a lot of problems on the exam. As I mentioned in the past, this new exam has about a 63% pass rate. It's not great, but usually we find that participants that go through these uh, New York test prep courses, uh, at least ours anyway, uh, the data that we have, uh, we don't have data from our competitors, but at least in ours, we have like an 80, 85% pass success rate uh, for our for those that report back. So definitely it makes a big difference. Now, taking the, the the online exam and taking the online test prep course, I'm sorry, taking the three-day instructor lab course uh, definitely improves your odds even further. So something I definitely agree with the fact that uh, preparation is key when it comes to uh, getting ready for this learned exam. Now, mind you, this exam is not inexpensive. It's uh, Now it's up to $700, I believe, to take the exam you know, each time and you're only allowed to take it once every 45 days. Problem is that you know, you cannot be a system operator to work on the grid, uh, the grid control center, unless you have this certification. So in either case, um, usually the other questions we encounter have to do with um, problems relating to the system grid. In this case, let me see if I can take one up here. And uh, by the time we have it up on the presentation, we're we'll hopefully get it ready at that point. And one of the things that we always can always concerned with naturally is the fact that you are encountering problems that of course have to do with uh, either grid, grid disturbances or even reliability. So one of the things that we always worry about, of course, is standards have to do with NERC uh, EOP005, which is the uh, Black Star Restoration, EOP008, which is Backup Control Center Functionality, EOP004, which is uh, disturbance reporting. And I believe EOP006, which is again, uh, all the functions dealing with a reliability coordinator and how they, they coordinate uh, blackout restoration. So uh, well, let me see if I can get in here real quick. I apologize. And so this was called emergency preparedness and response. And in this case, we are now looking at the possibility of, let's see if I can share my screen, I cannot, so. Anyway, so we have a number of questions, right? And uh, uh, at least we're gonna talk about them. So one of the questions that we asked, right, is uh, question one was for the annual test of an entity's backup functionality operating plan to be valid. It must be demonstrate, it must demonstrate which of the following. So the question has uh, four possible answers, right? And let's read the question again, for the annual test, of an entity's backup functionality operate, operating plan to be valid, it must demonstrate which of the following. 
So on a NARC EOP008, they are, what that governs is the back and forth right? of uh, uh, making sure you have a plan, making sure the plan fits a certain set of standards, uh, requirements within the standard. And, and then also there are requirements re regarding the testing, the annual testing of that plan. So in this case, for example, uh, there is an annual test re required of each backup site. And that backup site, of course, must be done every year. So, and believe it or not, it's really easy for entities to miss that deadline. Um, so one of the things that they do is uh, they usually uh, go on operation of the backup site. And the requirement there is for it to operate for two continuous hours. Now, most entities will go there and set up and maybe operate all day. Some of them will operate in three hours. The point is they want to make sure they go through all that trouble. If they go through all the trouble, they're not going to miss the whole two-hour operating uh, requirement by a few minutes. When I used to work at the at the utilities, uh, we would basically our our backup sites were were usually far enough away that you know it took some time to get there. But what we would do was we'd have a shift report at the other site. They would turn control over officially, make all sorts of notifications, collect all sorts of evidence and then operate for about two hours and 30 minutes just to make sure we captured everything right. And when they say uh, back up functionality, it means not just that you're there and you're logged in, it means you have taken over control of your, your control system EMS, you take control of your communications, you sent out notifications, which is really important for evidence. Uh, you are also, you have also established the fact that you know you you are now made log entries and you officially taken over. So the other thing that's interesting um, that we have to remember is uh so here they have four possible answers. Of course, the first answer here is backup functionality is maintained for at least two continuous hours. That's the answer. Uh, the other questions here, or the other answers to this question are detractors, and it says all oh, chef personnel are comfortable to backup site. You know, it's not that that's not a criteria. So it's not an answer. Uh, C, transition times one hour or less, that is a detractor and it's also a wrong answer because you have to remember that uh, they have a two hour transition time also part of the requirements. So, and we'll get to that a little later. And then of course, the last possible answer is backup site is secure. So uh, one of the things to remember here is that now usually it's a two hour thing is pretty consistent in this EOP 008 standard. So what they're asking us here to do is um, to make sure you're operating for two hours at the backup site. And the other thing too, is that there, that, that, uh, and another question they might ask, you know, how long, how long do you have to get to, to trans fully transition from the primary to the backup control center and, and to fully transition. And that's the important thing. So it's two hours to fully transition, but that means that it's two hours to get to leave a control center or go to the backup site physically, get in, log in get everything set up and be fully transitioned, meaning that you, are, you have been able to actually go there and, and, and transfer control over, right? That means all your vital, vital functions, communications, EMS control, and all the systems you need to actually operate the system. That's what they mean by fully transitioned two hours. It doesn't mean you have two hours to drive there because it's going to take you some more time to get in there and get set up and start running. So that is one of the questions here. Let's do the next one over. The next one is question two. It says a balancing authority, a BA, is experiencing low voltage in the northeast region. A 50 MBA generator, that area is loaded at 50 megawatts, right? So the question goes on what action should a, could a system operator take to increase the voltage in that area? So, one of the things to, they have, they have four possible answers. Number one is increase generation to overload capacity. That's not what you're doing, right? Uh, the next one is decrease reactive power of to voltage increases. Okay. That could be a, that could be a, a solution, but, uh, that's not really how that works. Uh, the next one is decrease real power and increase reactive power. That might, that sounds like a good one. And then D do nothing. The AVR would take care. All right. So, uh, so remember, so you have a balancing authority. It has a generator that's rated at 50 MVA and it's loaded at 50 megawatts. That means that the generator has basically used up all of its capability in putting out only real power. It no longer has any ability to, to put out any kind of reactive power, meaning it can't do any kind of ours at this point. 
So 50 MBA, 50 megawatts, there's no room at all for, for bars at all. And remember, that's that power, that, that power triangle. We have real reactive power and then the apparent power. So increasing generation overall capacity is not a good, that, that's not a good solution, right? Um, B, decrease reactive power towards increases. That's the worst thing you could do, right? Because then you're going to make the, uh, the the voltage probably even worse. Skip over to D. Do nothing. AVR will take care of it. Well, the AVR would work if you had room to maneuver. So the answer here really is C, right? Decrease real, real power and increase reactive power. So and most generators have what they call a capability curve, which they call it the D curve. D is in delta. And this, because it looks like a D. So this capability curve really is uh, once you're at the highest real power output, you don't have any more room to actually be able to like either absorb or 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 put out wires. So if you decrease, for example, the real power just by three, four, five percent, you're giving yourself a really significant 10, 50 percent ability to then use that, use that to be able to send uh, reactor resources out into the system. So here you sacrifice megawatts a little bit because you may not have, for example, a megawatt deficiency. You have a voltage deficiency. So reducing megawatts is, isn't even a problem in this case, uh, or it, it isn't explained to be a problem. So here you can afford to back down on megawatts and then instead put out megabars uh, just by backing down on the real power and then replacing that with reactive power. So that's why here C is the answer, decrease real power and increase reactive. The last question we have on here is uh, interconnection frequency. Is that 59.85 um, hertz? So interconnection frequency is at 59.85 hertz. The system operator has not experienced any disturbances. What does this indicate? Well, if you don't have a problem in your system and your system is showing a low frequency, there's a good chance there's something happening outside your system. You haven't lost generators. You don't have a voltage collapse. You don't have a your ACE is still fine, right? You're, you're, you're meeting all your load. But that means something has happened outside your system. So let's look at the answers. A is interconnection voltage and load are not balanced. No, it's it's voltage is probably being supplied fine. And, and then the the load out there may not, uh, may not be balanced with generation, but I want to say it's in balance with voltage. So that's not a good answer. B interconnection system loads are higher than online generation. That's that's that sounds more the correct answer. C a collective system generation is higher than system load. That is uh, exact opposite to what's happening here. If that would be the case, you'd have higher frequency than sixty hertz. So in this case, the C is not the answer. And then D a loss of load again, not the answer either. Because if you lost load. You'd have more generation than load, and you've had you would have higher frequencies. So in this case, <clears throat> Bravo interconnection system loads are higher than online generation is the correct answer. So of course that means that you don't have enough generation to supply the load. Numbers. Well, the next question here is: You receive an alarm that indicates low gas pressure on a SF6, which is sulfur hexafluoride transmission break. Indications show the pressure is continuing to drop. What action would you take? Now, before we go any further, let me explain why it's important. So, sulfur hexafluoride has the ability to break the arc whenever a, a, a breaker either opens up, and that's used to extinguish the, far, the fault. I mean, sorry, extinguish the arc across the the, uh, the contacts. So, if you lose pressure and you lose gas, then it induces the ability to not only uh, clear an arc, but then also clear a false, which is even more severe, right? So as, as usually there's compressors that keep the pressure high and there's a reservoir tank that keeps all, all that will supply. So if you're going to lose pressure in that, in that particular breaker, you're going to, you're going to have an issue. So uh, response one, what action would you take? So A, isolate the breaker and dispatch maintenance personnel to inspect. Okay. B, operate the breaker to see if the alarm will clear. Okay. No. C, reduce the power flow to the breaker. If you have a fault, it still won't function as needed. It may not function at all. You know, some of these breakers use compressed air of SF6 gas to actually operate. So that's another concern also. And the last one, D, wait to see if the breaker trips. I know, so worst possible solution. So A is isolate the breaker and dispatch maintenance personnel to the spike. So in this case, the sooner you, you, you take it out of service and isolate it, the better off you are because 
the longer you wait, the less capable that breaker is of functioning reliably and safely. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next question here. A, uh, which of the following is used to help balance a system after it separates from the interconnection during a disturbance? Okay. So, uh, which of the following is used to help balance a system after it separates from the interconnection during a disturbance? So, they have different options, right? You got automatic under frequency load shed, UFLS. You got B, automatic under voltage load shed, right? You have, you have C, generation under frequency trips, gener and then D, automatic generation controls, AGC. So, what do we want to accomplish here with this particular problem, right? So, you want to balance a system after it separates from the interconnection, right? So usually what's going to happen when you separate, you are possibly losing some of the power that's being imported, right, into your system. In a lot of cases, right, you are probably buying power from, from, from outside your system, which means you are likely, uh, you're not supplying all that load with your own generation. You're importing power from the outside. The reason B is not exactly a correct answer is, now, mind you, that may take into effect, but under voltage load shedding usually happens in certain pockets, right? Certain areas in your system, not widespread. Under frequency load shed happens at almost every single distribution station that you have in your system. So that's why automatic under frequency load shedding is likely the answer here, which is A. Let's talk about why C is not correct either. Generation under frequency trips. Um, that might happen eventually uh, if... But mind you, if you lose generators, you're going to lose your frequency will drop even further. So usually what happens when you separate, uh, you have you have a deficiency in generation versus load. Your system will will, will see a decline in frequency. It'll go below 59.98 hertz, it'll keep dropping. And then these other frequency load shed schemes will shed load at different stages in different steps. And usually about uh, about 10% of your load, up to 10% of your load, or even more than that. And the way that works is ideally is that it sheds enough load and then and then it continues to, to uh, measure in real time what your frequency is. So ultimately, what your frequency balances out, if you've done enough automatic load shedding through the under frequency load shed scheme, at some point you're going to approach 60 hertz or better, and then, then you will stop shedding load at that point, right? Uh, if it will not restore those those uh, those breakers that your that your system opened, right? It, it'll just stay s stable at that point, giving you a, a chance to recover and a chance to re reconnect back to the interconnection. If you happen to fail and you don't shed enough load and you have lost so much generation, or you lot you have such a disturbance where frequency declines a lot far more beyond that your UFLS can actually help you, you will begin to see generator only frequency trips. But that is not used to help balance the system. That's another thing why this answer C is not correct. Answer A is not correct. The answer is automatic UFLS, automatic under frequency load shedding, is the tool to help you balance your system after a separate. AGC, of course, um, it won't be sufficient. It'll help you with your race, but in reality, right, you you're highly limited. But with, with what it can do, it, it sounds like a good answer. It can really help with minor changes, but it's it, it's very slow. UFLS works in a matter of cycles, very quickly, right? Cycles or seconds or milliseconds. So they function very quickly, whereas AGC takes minutes and not many minutes to actually take action and you haven't seen any results. All right, next question. So question, the next question is, in the initial stages of a restoration condition, high transmission voltage problems are more likely than low transmission voltage problems. Okay, why? Well, let's talk about what happens in a, in, a, in a blackout restoration system. So in a blackout, you have basically, the, all of your generation is shut down. You are likely have been separated from the interconnection, you're on your own, and you are now all of your system is connected through closed breakers, but you are de-energized. And you may find some open breakers that on the other side of that, you may see an energized system, which is outside your area, or maybe in your area where you, you, you have partial blackout. But so in order to restore your system, you're going to start with some basic generation, black star units, small generators, or maybe you're going to energize from outside your system. 
and start working your way down your transmission system. So transmission circuits, whenever they are lightly loaded or have no load at all, act as giant capacitors. And what happens is once you're energizing, you put voltage on them, those lines begin to generate bars, which will, again, raise your voltage. And in some cases, raise it way beyond that positive 10%, which is a problem because you may find yourself with uh, insulator flashovers. So one of the things that happens here, the answer here is, of course, D, right? Because of the excessive megawatt supply for the energization of transmission line, right? And so that, that that's the answer. So here they have possible answers, A, because the excessive megawatt supply from too many online generators, that won't be the case because all your generators are offline. You have very little generators on, if any. But likely you're restoring from a black start uh, resource or from the interconnection. Uh, that's wrong. So B, because of the efficiency of megawatt from too much customer order energization, that's not correct either. Uh, C, because of the efficiency of megawatts from too much customer order, that's also not correct, right? So the correct answer here is because the excessive megawatt supply from the energization of transmission lines, and that is because the transmission lines are lightly loaded or not loaded at all. Okay. So a system operator has exhausted all available resources and redispatch options. System voltage continues to decline. What should the system operator do next? So, okay, so we have different options here, right? So system operator exhausted all available resources and weak dispass conditions. System voltage continues to decline. That means you've got every generator running. That means you are, you're, you still got load uh, that you're supplying. Uh, you will have no more of availability of, of, of buying power. Problem is even buying power from neighbors may actually impact you in, in a problem, right? So, so what are your options? A, contact the reliability coordinator. You probably already did that. B, shed load in the low voltage area. Okay, that's an option. Uh, mind you, system voltage continues to decline. And remember, voltage voltage declines happen in certain pockets, not throughout your system. If it begins to happen throughout your system, you got some serious problems and you're just moments away from a blackout. C, start a VAR input schedule. That's not an answer. VARs do not travel very well. And then D, check under the check the Check on the under voltage settings. No, that's not what you do. Right? It's too late for that. So uh, the correct answer here really is shedding load in the low voltage area. So when we, once you once you do that, that load in that area being shed will improve the voltage profile on that area that is that's deficient and and of course showing that decline in voltage. So that, that's really the best answer and the correct answer in this case. Now, of course, there's other options there as well, which I don't show here, right? If you had capacitor banks that are out there, I would deploy capacitor banks. I would change taps on transformers. I would um, try and try and uh, bring on additional generation in this case, right? Uh, I would make sure that I have taken all the other reactive devices out of service. Those usually are are there to bring down voltage. Now, that's happened before. I've seen some of them leave a reactor back in service during the peak of the day. Uh, a few other things can be done. They can probably do a voltage reduction on the distribution side, and that raises transmission voltage. But that causes, I mean, that can cause other problems, but you're allowed to do up to 3%. Most utilities do 2 to 2.5%. Um, yeah, that, what that does is that, to me, that shifts the problem a little bit of distribution, but it helps transmission. So there's a number of options out there, um, but the here you know, the the ultimate option here is shedding load on the voltage area, and that'll be the most immediate impact. And you're doing it in a certain control pocket where that voltage is suffering. All right. So uh, question about well, the next question: In the early stages of a power system restoration, 500 megawatts of generation is synchronized with 300 megawatts of available spinning reserve. That means that you've already picked up 200 megawatts of load. What is the largest load block that can be restored while still maintaining acceptable frequency control? Usually, the rule of thumb is five percent of the uh, of the synchronized generation, right? And you so five percent of of 50 is 25, and that's that's really what you're using. So the answer here is either A, 15, B, 10. C25 or D50. So here the answer will be 25. It is very tempting for people to actually say, well, let's do let's do 5% of 300. 
which is what's about reality that that's not how that works. Usually it's the, the, the governor is the one that takes action in this case and uh, helps you pick up that load. Now remember the other, the other reason too, is that that 5% of the uh, synchronized online generation has to do with cold load pickup. And uh, if you pick up, for example, 25 megawatts, it may feel instantaneously at 200 megawatts because it can be almost 10 times as much. And then eventually it, uh, after a few, and that's because of all of the, all of the, uh, water inrush current for all those AC synchronous motors, it takes a little water pickup speed. And then eventually once they pick up speed or a matter of a few seconds, then that, that begins to taper off again. And it comes back down to what they call steady state. That'll feel like 25 megawatts at that. Okay. We got four minutes left here, but we're going to go ahead and do it a little bit. So the next one is balancing authority. A has implemented rotating blackouts of their native load customers due to a generation efficiency. So they are already in, 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 in trouble. They were, they, and they're doing energy emergency alerts at this point, right? So the question is what level energy emergency alert and EEA would the RC declare for this BA? So here the answer will be uh, EEA level three, right? So they got EEA level zero, one, two, and three for A, B, and C, right? Level zero means you're you're done with the event that you're totally backing out and the event is over. So that's not zero. EEA level one means you have committed every single resource and yet you are still able to withstand losing your most severe single contingency, meaning, meaning you can lose your biggest generator and still be able to supply your load, right? And uh, which means you're, you're able to actually survive one, you know, one contingency. EEA level two means you are not able to survive that contingency. Meaning that if you lost that generator, for example, it's the biggest one in your system, you will have to go ahead and shed load, which means that'll put you at a level three. In this case, you are now, you haven't lost a generator yet, but, but the, the day just kept on grinding on and the load kept on climbing and you couldn't find any more resources or couldn't buy more power. You could not uh, import, you could not put any more generation on. So at this point, you're now about to get ready to uh, start shedding low to be able to be able to survive. So that would be an EEA level three at this point. That means you're shedding for Okay. Oh, here we go again. During the initial stages of the system restoration process, load pickups should be limited to what percentage of the total synchronized generation. And we cut, we covered that earlier, right? That 5% rule of thumb. So 5% of the total synchronized generation, right? So, uh, and that's really the answer is pretty simple. Okay. And the next question here is in the early stages of system restoration, the frequency is 59 Hertz. How much load should the system operator shed to restore frequency of 60 Hertz? So usually another rule of thumb here is usually six to 10% of the connected load. And that is what will get you, will raise your, your, your system frequency by one Hertz. So if you shed, you know, if you have a, a you have like a, a hundred megawatts already connected and you're, and you're, you're slower frequency. You want to bring that up well, one Hertz where you shed, you know, a good, like six to 10 megawatts. So it'll be like, uh, it'll be like uh, six to 10, you know, six to 10 of your load in that case. And you should be able to recover at that point. All right. And I think we are now officially at the end of our uh, session here. Um, one last question I can cover here real quick. During a system restoration, which of the following transmission lines would be the best choice to energize the facility, right? So uh, here we have different choices, right? And remember what I said earlier that a, um, a transmission line that's lightly loaded acts as a giant capacitor. So if you have shorter overhead lines are usually better than underground or cables, a cable, the capacitor effect is even worse. And the longer it is, that's exacerbated even further. So a 10 mile overhead transmission line is the best. It's less capacitive, right? A 10 mile underground transmission line is worse. 25 mile overhead transmission line is also pretty bad when it comes to generating bars and raising your voltage. And then the, the worst one of all is the 25 mile underground transmission line. So that'll be the worst of all of these to when it comes to, um, to uh, really affecting and raising your voltage in the week. All right. So I think we have reached the end of the show today. I'll cover a number of questions. Sorry, we couldn't cover any more. I will go ahead and, uh, that, um, let the engineer take over at this point and I will sign off, but by all means, please go ahead and, um, 
if you have any questions, by the way, or or I'm sure post production, they will also post the uh, slide deck that goes with this presentation. So I apologize, but uh, luckily these questions were all ver verbal. That they, they were, I mean, were all text. There weren't any diagrams or scenarios or any calculations much. So hopefully this could uh, be simple, um, and, and I'm sure we can cover some more in, in another session again. So, all right, thank you again, and hope you all have a wonderful day.